Good morning, Hope Sound Bible Church, and all of the rest of you who have gathered together to worship today. We welcome you. If you have a prayer request that you would like for us to remember and to possibly mention, if you want to text it to the number there on your screen, we will do our best to uh, remember that in prayer and put it on our prayer list here at, at the church. <clears throat> I opened my Bible to 1 Peter a couple of days ago, and I noticed that Peter did not address his letter to a church or to churches. Listen. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers or to the aliens scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. You see, persecution under Nero and difficult times had caused them to scatter. What he wrote was probably read just by individuals or maybe in house churches, home churches perhaps by people hunkered down and fearful of the next wave of persecution. So please allow me as we begin this service to personalize Peter's message for us today. It would go something like this. I, Wesley, a servant of the Lord, to the faithful and sometimes fearful believers scattered throughout Hope Sound and Jupiter and Stewart and Alabama, Ohio, literally around the world. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath caused us to be born again to a living hope by the resin resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I guess I would just insert again here today as we did last week, he is risen. He is risen indeed. So that we might obtain an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled without pain and viruses. It's reserved for us in heaven. See, you are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein we greatly rejoice, even though now just for a little while, if need be, ye are distressed because of various trials. Listen, scattered saints, the trial of your faith is much more precious than of gold that passes away though it be tested with fire, and it might be found unto the praise and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom we haven't seen, but we love, in whom though now ye see him not yet believing, we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. Scattered, hunkered down saints. Lift up your heads. Rejoice in the Lord and rejoice in our great hope. Let us come and sing unto the Lord. And we do invite you to join in and worship with us today. We're going to start out by singing, How Can I Say Thanks for the Things You Have Done for Me? Thank you. 
praise, his, praise the Lord. My heart is filled with praise this morning. How about you? Amen. Glorifying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's time to pray. And I'm so glad that God is not limited to time or space, location. And we're encouraging you to join together with those around about you. If you're uh, with your family, join together as we pray today, wherever you might be, whoever, where, wherever you are around the world. There are a number of requests that have come in, and, and I know that God is interested in these, already knows about these. But let's, let's just mention some of, for some of them, our local requests for our people here, praying for our people here. But there are many that have come in for those um, texting in and so on. I see that Glenn Galt has requested prayer for Lesotho, where they are missionaries there in South Africa, a very um, difficult political um, conditions. So let's pray for Glenn and their ministry there for the country of Lesotho. Continue to remember our own Kathy Brown suffering uh, a, a great deal. And so let do remember Kathy. And Jerry Weaver is scheduled for surgery this week and possibly even open heart surgery. So let's do remember Jerry. Let's remember Pastor McCarty's uh, father in prayer not doing very well. I trust that we remember our Brother McCarty today. Please pray for the Molina family who lost both of their parents this past week. And Megan Shirk has requested prayer. Her grandmother passed away. And so let's remember the family um, in that situation. And then a request just came in. Um, a backslidden man who has cancer and now has COVID ID, has only two days to live, um, I believe up in Greenberg area. So do, please do remember that request as we pray. A Hope Sound Bible College alumnus has sent an, in a request for a daughter, and she's also praying about uh, possibly f uh, a future move in God's will in her life. And then right from here locally, um, Nicole from one of the waitresses down at a local restaurant here in town just lost her daughter and leaves behind a little girl. So do pray for that. Also, um, there's a request that comes in again from Gospel Publishing Mission. We're asking for, the publish, uh, for prayer for the publishing of Is God Really My Father? in a language that is spoken in Iran, the language of Farsi. And so please do remember that as we pray. Then I'm just gonna give you a, a sampling of a request that comes to our prayer, um, pause and prayer, uh, pray station out here, out front. And um, this is just a, a, a sample of a request. Please pray for a young father named Alex, who has been diagnosed with stage four cancer. He and his wife have two daughters. And even while we've been here this morning, there are people who have stopped by out front here, put in requests, or just stopped to pause and pray. There are so many needs, but we have a great big God. Praise, God. Praise his name. None of this has missed his attention. So please, there will be a number of these requests scrolling as we pray today, but I trust that as we, as we prepare our hearts, we're gonna take just a moment of silence, a few, few moments of silence and quietness before Pastor Matt comes to lead us in prayer.
Dear precious Heavenly Father, we just continue in your presence this morning. And as we've used these words, and we've read these words out front many different times in the past few weeks, we, we know your scripture says that we ought to pray without ceasing, and dear Lord, it should be the, the attitude of our heart continuously praying and seeking your wisdom and will and direction and, and uh, answers to prayer in our life. But, but here this morning, dear God, we just collectively, wherever we are, uh, dear Lord, we just pause to pray. Dear Lord, to call on your name together. Dear Lord, to lift up our voices as children of, of God. Dear Lord, to realize that, that you are one who sits far above the heavens. Dear Lord, and you are watching and aware of all that is taking place. And dear God, as we've listened to these requests this morning, as we've heard uh, the, the request of those who are facing some uh, surgeries and procedures this week, we think of Olive who was taken to the uh, emergency room last evening with a possible stroke and and dear Lord as we think of those things the fear that grips the heart and a sense as never before just simply because they're going alone they're going by themselves uh, family members not even allowed in the rooms with them and pastoral prayer not able to be right there present with them and it's a whole different look but yet dear God our heart breaks for them our heart is is a uh, concern for them but we are uh, resting in this fact and taking comfort in the fact that God, you who sit far above the heavens, dear Lord, you have a way of going down into those emergency rooms, those operating rooms where the nerves might be just on edge and speaking peace. You have a way to sending your blessed Holy Spirit uh, into the nursing homes and the facilities there where loneliness seems to be uh, the order of the day and speaking sweet peace to their hearts and, and, and perhaps just reminding them of what you've done in their life and of the great things that have been seen because of you working in their life and rejoicing coming from within as you and they have a wonderful time together. Dear Lord, we thank you that, dear Lord, in times like this when we seem as if our hands are tied and, and we're limited, dear Lord, we, we know that you are not and we rest in that today. We ask that, God, that you would go to the ones uh, uh, in Texas who are grieving, the ones who are, who are facing right here in Hope Sound a, a time of loss, dear Lord, we ask that you would comfort them and meet with them in a special way. We think of Ken Morgan. We think of, uh, uh, of him as he's facing a very low time. And Roy McCarty uh, facing cancer. We think of our very own Sue McElwain and George and Ruth Vernon. Dear Lord, continue to encourage and help along the way. Uh, dear Lord, we think above and beyond every physical need. We think of the spiritual needs. We think of the backslider today. We think of those who need to be reclaimed. Dear Lord, we think of those who need just to sense your, your touch in their life and being saved perhaps for the very first time. We pray that through your faithfulness that they would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would meet these needs. Continue to be with us as Hope Sound uh, uh, congregants. Dear Lord, not only here at the church, the college, and FEA, uh, continue to help our ministries, dear Lord, that we would be a light in a dark world, uh, that we would be a help in times just like this. And Lord, as you would help and as you would continue to move and work, dear Lord, we will thank you and praise you for it all. We ask it in Jesus' precious name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank God for prayer. Prayer that is not limited to just a collective sense, but wherever we are, we can call on his name. Praise God. We're going to give you just a, a couple of announcements, and we do want to remind you that any time throughout the week, any time throughout the week, you can uh, go to our Facebook page, our Instagram page, and you will find uh, a phone number that has been on our screen here, 772-260-2170, and you can text that number at any time. You can leave messages via our social media if you would like, and uh, we are we gather uh, on a regular basis, and we will pray for those needs together, and uh, we will join with you. So anytime throughout the week, feel free to, to send a text of a, of a prayer request, and we would love to pray with you about those needs. In Focus, Youth Service will be here on Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock. You're, you're invited to join in to that if you would so choose to do so, our young people especially. So keep that in mind. We also want to remind you that this coming week, 
was our scheduled IH convention in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, because of the circumstances, that had to be canceled. And uh, so they are trying to do something a little different, uh, really a whole lot different, never done before. A cyber convention, and it's going to start on Tuesday, going through Thursday, as the convention would have. You can go to the, uh, their, their, their ihconvention.com. You can go to their Facebook, uh, IH uh, Interchurch Holiness Convention Facebook page, and you will find a schedule of events that are taking place starting Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Tuesday evening, it will be a mixture of some live streaming, uh, some live interviews. Uh, it's going to have some music uh, interspersed throughout, and then also uh, there will be some archived messages that are shared. And so if, if you can, uh, feel free to join in. We'd love for you to pray for this event, pray that God would use it as an encouraging tool, and God would use it in a special way and anoint these efforts. So, so pray for this and join in when you can. We also just want to remind you that as the COVID-19 uh, continues to, to, to play its role in our lives, uh, we are going to probably start in the near future, in the next few days, uh, regularly updating our Facebook page, our web page uh, of the steps that we are taking to looking at what our reopening looks like. I know that there's a lot of confusion. One, one governor will say this, our governor will say that, and everybody has an opinion. And uh, no matter when it will be, it's either going to be too late for some or too early for others. But I want you to know that we are trying to stay in tune with our local officials and trying to figure out uh, some guidance there. We've been in touch with some of our legal counsel. And uh, we ask an interest in your prayers as staff and, and a board of directors that God would just give us the, the leadership as we try to, to figure these things out. Uh, one of our most important things is why we're, in, we're interested interested in and trying to contact and be in connection with our congregation. We also want to continue to have a positive impact in our community. And so we want to make sure that as we make these decisions, it would be a decision that would benefit all of us. So keep these things uh, in prayer for us, please. We're going to take a time of fellowship. We haven't done this in a while. Now it's going to look a little different. We're not going to stand up and shake hands because it's pretty much virtually impossible in our setting. But uh, this last week, many of you joined in. And uh, as our drive-by greeting took place, Josh Powell has done a fantastic job. So at this time, at this time, uh, there's going just to be a time of fellowship. Sit back and enjoy this video, and we hope that it's an encouragement to you. Coronavirus has gotten everything out of kilter, and so we're just wanting to drive around campus and uh, see who's out there. And so at this time, join us for our journey around Hope Sound campus. Tyler doing? You gotta goof off sometimes, right? Hi! Hi, We're standing right here with Justice Maley and uh, the coronavirus has really slowed some things down. Just going to pop a question at you. What is the thing that you are so ready for this to be over for? To resume a normal life. Greetings. Hey, everybody. Love you guys. Praying for you. Fish, how are you doing, sir? Just fine. 
Has this put any dampers on your leaving anytime soon, or are you staying longer than you anticipated? Yes, we was going to leave two weeks ago, and now we're going to try to leave next week. Next week. What have you been doing to pass the time? Sitting right there. Hey, thanks so much for your time. How are you doing, ma'am? <laughs> I'm doing fine. So far, so good. How are things treating you during this coronavirus? We're doing great. I'm obviously within my six feet, but so thank you so much for stopping by. <laughs> You're welcome. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Doing well. How are you enjoying having no school? Well, it's actually not no school. I have to do homeschool. You mean you're actually doing it at home? Yes. Are you enjoying it? No. What grade are you in? Third. Third grade. You just were gone for the weekend, weren't you? Yeah. Was it cold up north? Yes. You like it better north or south? South. Good. Hey, have a good day. We're standing here with the, the famous pianist of Hope Sound Bible Church in this coronavirus scenario. How are you doing, Carrie Finney? I'm doing good. Grocery shopping for everyone. Has this had a great impact on your life? It has. It has. Hey. Maybe for the best. Hey. And I didn't know this was going to happen tonight here. <laughs> well, I'm invading your space, so thank you so much. Good luck, everybody. Stay safe. God's got this. Thank you to everyone who stood outside and waved. It was great to see you. We hope that you're doing well, and we're praying for you. And if there's anything we can do as a church body to be an encouragement to you, let us know. God bless you. Thanks for joining. Well, we hope that you enjoyed that, and we do want you to know we are praying for each one of you, and trusting God will continue to help you and bless you during this time. We're coming to you this morning for offering and tithe. Uh, thank you so much for your giving over the past few weeks. This past week, against a budget of $14,100, uh, we, we received 16300 so thank you so much for your giving. And on your screen, you see four ways in which you can give online at HopesoundBibleChurch.com. You can bring it into the church office, mail it in to P.O. Box 1065, Hope Sound 33475. Uh, I'm going to get that right one of these times after it's all said and done. And you can bring it into the campus post office, whichever you choose to do. Thank you so much for your generosity. Lord bless the McDowells as they minister at this time.
is your past a memory that binds you? Is there some pain that you've carried for too long? Then strengthen your heart with his good news. There is a Savior and he's forgiven. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful song, Jalena McDowell. And may God bless you for your, your continual giving. We cannot say enough thanks for, for your support during this time. We appreciate it so, so very, very much. Rob Kranzman is coming to minister in song, after which we'll be bringing the morning message. Let's pray for him as he ministers at this time. In spite of everything that's going on in the world and in our country right now, I'm glad that I can choose to place my trust in God. Amen. He's the one that changes not. He said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. I choose to trust him today. Have you ever been beaten low? The doubts and questions are learned so that is when the tempter always comes you wonder is our God the same you wonder if he knows your name in spite of all your doubts just say to him, I choose to trust the God I cannot see. I choose to walk the path he chose for me. I choose to love the one who gave his life for me. I choose to put my faith and trust in Christ. God said in his words so dear, draw nigh to me and I'll draw near. Resist the evil one and he must flee. So then, 
my friend, take up your shield to Satan's darts. You must never yield. Lift up your heart to God and say, I choose to trust the God I cannot see. I choose to walk the path he chose for me. I choose to love the one who gave his life for me. I choose to put my faith and trust in Christ. I choose to love the one who gave his life for me. I choose to put my faith and trust in Christ. Amen. Thank you. Rob Gransman for that beautiful song, and what a joy it is for every one of us to be able to say, if we so choose, I put my trust in Him. It's our choice, and what a privilege and an honor, and a joy it is to do so. We're going to be looking in Joshua chapter 4 this morning. We're going to get there in just a moment, but if you'd like to open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 4. There is a large portion of the Old Testament that is given to the Israelites' captivity, exodus, and then entering into the promised land. It is a high probability that most of us have heard bits and pieces of this journey many, many, many times, but yet I find that it never grows old. As you remember, God had told Abraham that he had a particular plan for his life. God was going to make Abraham to be the father of many nations if Abraham would, by faith, step out and follow God's leadership. In this conversation, back in Genesis 15, God tells Abraham part of what his plan looks like. Genesis 15, verse 13, God says, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. What a fantastic reminder that God is the one who knows everything. Long before their captivity, God had told Abraham, this is how it's going to be. Just as a side note, this truth remains real today. There is nothing that takes God by surprise. God knew about Israel's captivity, and He knows about the COVID-19. Everything that happens in this world, God knows about, He's aware of. Nothing takes Him by surprise. As I was studying this portion of Old Testament history, it really stuck out to me that there were reasons as to why the Israelites found themselves in bondage. Admittedly, we've all probably asked these questions. Why did God allow the Israelites, His chosen people, to suffer 400 plus years under the Egyptian oppression? How did this come to pass? Why was this allowed? You see, Joseph and his brothers had died, and the children of Israel were multiplying in the land of Egypt. They held important positions. They played important roles in the political, cultural, and economic life of the country. And because of this, it is not surprising that they stirred just a little jealousy of the native Egyptians who seemed to be outshining, being outshined by the foreigners. Old King Pharaoh had died, and two, a new king ascended to the throne. He seemed to have no sympathy or love for the children of Israel and chose to forget all that Joseph had done for Egypt. He decided to take action against the growing influence and the number of the children of Israel. The new king called his council together, and they advised him to enslave these people, to oppress them before they would grow too powerful. 
Pharaoh limited the personal freedoms of the Hebrews. He put heavy taxes on them, recruited their men into forced labor crews under the supervision of some pretty harsh taskmasters. Thus, the children of Israel had to build cities and erect monuments. They constructed roads and they worked in the quarries and shaped stones or made bricks and tiles. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the harder the restrictions imposed upon them became, the more the children of Israel increased and multiplied. Finally, when King Pharaoh saw that the, the forcing of the Hebrews to do hard work did not succeed by in suppressing their rapidly growing numbers, he decreed that all newborn male children of the Hebrews to be thrown into the Nile River, only the daughters should be permitted to live. Thus, Pharaoh hoped to end the numerical increase of the Jewish population. And at the same time, he desired to eliminate a danger which, according to predictions of his astrologers, threatened his own life in the person of a leader to be born to the children of Israel. So, one could easily say that the reason that the Israelites were enslaved were because of a jealous new king over Egypt. But was this the real reason? Again, I would just point out that a jealous king did not interrupt God's plan for his people. He had them exactly where he wanted them. After God told Abraham of Israel's future of enslavement, he went on to explain some positives that would come out of this captivity. Perhaps as a reminder that he, this was indeed the road in which he, God himself, had chosen for his people. Verse 14, 15, and 16, we read these words. He's speaking, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. And later on it says in verse 16, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet yet complete. One of the positive results of the Israelites leaving Egypt would be they were going to leave with some great possessions. Of course, in order to leave Egypt, you had to first be there, and God had promised that their exit would mean some great abundance for Israel. This was fulfilled in Exodus 12, and when the Israelites left Egypt following the 10th plague, they were told to ask the Egyptians for items of value for their journey. The people of Israel asked the Egyptians for silver and gold, jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked for. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. But secondly, the Lord was, was having them to tarry there for so long because yet the Amorites, the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet complete. The Amorites worshipped other gods. They participated in numerous other sins. God promised to remove them from the land where Israel would one day live. However, God had a specific period in mind that included 400 years for Israel and Egypt. He is undoubtedly slow to anger and abounding in mercy, as Psalms 103.8 would remind us. Once the Israelites did return to the land of uh, uh, promise to them, the Amorites then were destroyed just as the Lord had predicted. Perhaps this 400 plus year stint in Egypt was to remind everyone of God's grace and strength to those in trouble, but also to show a world that he is indeed long suffering and merciful, which we all know he is. He is aware of sin in our world, and it is because of the fall that we have sin in our world. But this verse seems to indicate that God's mercy and long-suffering allows him, and I use this word very cautiously, to tolerate uh, sin while he is faithfully working on sinful man's behalf, a measure of sinfulness. But there is a certain line, there is seemingly a level of sin that a nation will reach that brings brings God's wrath and divine just, justice, and apparently the Amorites had not yet reached that threshold. 
God certainly could have chosen a different way, a different time frame for placing the Israelites in their promised land. But for whatever reason, he chose a particular way to send his children to be enslaved in bondage in Egypt. Why would he allow such a thing? As I was studying this, I found this to be said again and again, and it was simply this, that it might bring glory to himself that it might bring glory to himself. After the Israelites had suffered about all they felt they could suffer, and after the Amorite sin had come to completion, God showed up in a powerful way. His timing is always perfect. May we never forget that God's timing is always perfect. God sent Moses to deliver his children out of the ugliness of slavery and to lead them into the land promised them back in Genesis. And along Along the way, he fulfilled some mighty, mighty things that continually brought honor and glory to his name. Literally, as you think of these things, it could just blow your mind to realize the power of God at work. I want us to look at the journey, if we will, for just a few moments. I notice a miracle number one. God uses a shepherd whose name was once on the execution list of the aforementioned jealous king, Moses, who had been stored in a floating basket by his parents so that his life would be spared, found himself rescued by the very people who wanted him dead. He was raised in the very palaces, schooled by the very educational system, that, uh, uh, and placed in places of importance by the very people who were down deep scared of this one. As Moses grows older, he finds himself gravitating towards his root, and there was a time in his life that he made a distinct choice to follow with his people. And it seems that there came a time in his life after some ruckus there in, in, in the palaces that he finds himself tending to his father-in-law's flocks of sheep. One day, while tending the sheep, Moses sees a bush that is burning, but yet it isn't being consumed. He checks it out only to hear the holy voice of God call out to him and give Moses some specific instructions. Moses, by faith, follows these instructions. And then after the ten plagues, Pharaoh gives everything that is being asked of the Israelites and says, would you please leave? Would you have ever dreamed that a shepherd would be the Israel's deliverer? It wasn't a majestic king's clout or his mighty armies, but an obedient shepherd, a follower of God. Forever humanity would know that God can and will use anyone who will by faith obediently follow his commands and his wills. God is always glorified when ordinary people will by faith fully surrender to his leadership. The gospel has spread the greatest. Heaven has increased its size the most when ordinary people will fully and have fully submitted to God's leadership and guidance. This was allowed to happen that God would receive glory. We continue the journey and we see a second miracle. The Israelites are on their way. They are finally free from the harsh and extreme dictatorship of Pharaoh and its harsh taskmasters. But as usually the case, God has not given Moses a roadmap as how to get from Egypt to the promised land. What would they do? Well, let's be reminded God always has a plan in place. As Moses and the children of Israel became worried, God spoke to Moses and explained his plan. Moses I've got this. Here's what I'm going to do. And God laid out and provided a divine GPS. There will always be, he says, a cloud in the sky by day and a pillar of fire in the sky by night. If you keep your eyes focused on these two things, you will find yourself right where you're supposed to be. Wow, this morning, what a miracle by faith Moses and this group of people follow God's divine GPS. Often, Christian, we find that God has not provided a clear and specific roadmap of what our journey to heaven will look like. 
Only God knows the path that He desires for us to take. Only God knows the valleys in which He wants us to go through. Only God knows the dark nights that He wants us to face. Only God knows what hot, dry wilderness He wants us to go through and navigate. Only God knows. But be reminded, this journey isn't so much about my comfort and your pleasure as it is about God being glorified in all things. The Israelites did not enjoy or find comfort under the grueling thumb of Pharaoh, but it was the road in which God wanted them to travel. The Israelites did not find peace, not knowing the specifics about their journey, but God had a plan. While as Christians we may not know what we might face in our journey or where our journey might lead us, be certain of this one thing. God will lead us with His Word through His peace, through His faithfulness. It's just another way that if we by faith will submit to the will of God over and over and over again, no matter where the road of life takes us, He will be glorified because as we follow His will, His way, and His word, we can rest assured of this one thing, wherever we find ourselves is where God wants us to be. Miracle number three is seen. It is that long after the Israelites are on their way that the plagues are lifted and life is seemingly back to a little bit of normalcy in Egypt. It doesn't take long before Pharaoh and his council realize that they sorely miss the Israelites and all of their hard free labor. Kicking them for being duped into releasing their slaves, Pharaoh orders all of the armies, prepare the chariots, he says, saddle the horses, prepare for battle. In essence, they were going back to recapture their slaves. They were going to get their belongings back. I can only imagine that many of the Israelites going forward, they were moving as quickly as possible. They wanted to distance themselves from Egypt and fast. I can picture in my mind that they traveled with one eye on the road ahead and one eye on the road in which they've just traveled. Surely, Pharaoh would be coming up behind them soon. Fear was knocking on their heart's door, I am sure of it. Soon enough, Israeli scouts come tearing into camp, their faces white with fear. They're coming, and they are many. Panic begins to rip through the Israelites' camp. You see, they had found themselves between a rock and a hard place. Before them, where the cloud and the pillar of fire had led them, was the mighty Red Sea, and behind them, closing in fast, was the mighty Egyptian army. But what they seemed to fail to remember at that moment was above them was the all-seeing, powerful arm of God. And in their panic, death looking them square, in the face, the children of Israel began to complain, point fingers of blame, and began to say they were willing to return to slavery for the, their lives. Unfortunately, that is just what the flesh will do every time. But it was in their moment of weakness that God, right on time, showed up in might and strength. He gave sp explicit orders and commands. And as the leaders of the Israelites followed these orders, we know the beautiful story. The Red Sea parted and a million plus people walked across safely onto dry ground. Oh, how often we as Christians have found ourselves in the same places of the Israelites. We're thankful for deliverance, but yet we're at a place, a crossroads. We're gripped with panic and fear when our back is against the wall. At times, when it seems as if there is no way out, our weakness shows through brightly before everyone and God Himself, but God shows up right on time, responding and strength in power. When the only thing left to do is exercise our faith and depend on Him, we do so, and guess what? One more time, God shows up. You want to know why? Because this is the way that He has led us. The pillar of fire, the cloud, did not accidentally bring the Israelites between this rock and hard place. God's leadership didn't accidentally bring you and me into the challenging place there where there seems to be no escape. 
He brought them and He's brought us into a place for this purpose and on purpose. And what might that be? And that is in the middle of our weakness, in the middle of when we have the faintest clue of what to do, He can show up and He can be glorified one more time. Not only did God make a way but he also reminded the Israelites that he had power over the enemy as well by collapsing the watery walls while the Egyptian army was trying to pass across. We see miracle 4, 5, and 6 happening in relatively quick fashion. You can imagine the morale of the Israelites after such a great miracle. I'm sure that the parting of the waters and the defeat of the Egyptian army was talked about for quite some time. But the journey continues. The wilderness becomes more and more barren. And after three days, water holes have been sparse and, and they are thirsty. They are in desperate need of water. Their livestock needed water. Their children, their families needed water. It had been three days. The water was a must. They came to Mara and they found water only to be hugely disappointed because the water was undrinkable for it was bitter. They would think, once again, we will surely die. But it was at this time of need, God came up supplying their need, turning the waters sweet. It isn't long until food is scarce for the million plus people. There surely aren't enough cattle, chicken, and other livestock to feed this massive amount of people on a daily basis. Rumbling bellies began to cause tempers to flare and complaints to roll, and roll into the leadership's office. As Moses begins to take these complaints to God, he should not have been surprised to realize that God already had a plan in place. This food thing had already been figured out. God sent heavenly manna to the Israelites every day for 40 days to ensure that their bellies were full and their strength was maintained. Was it their favorite food? No, it was not. But it was enough to meet their needs to supply what they needed. But it wasn't long until the complaints began to rise again. Meat, meat, meat. Oh, we're tired of the manna. We need some meat. And yet again, God is already there and supplies them with enough quail to feed the masses until they had had their fill of meat. Over and over again, the Israelites were reminded that while they were on their God-appointed journey, that He was with them every step of the way. As long as they would obey and follow, He was there to supply their every need every time. Couldn't have God just led them a different way to the, to the promised land? Couldn't He just have led them straightway? Sure. But the purpose of this journey was higher than their comfort and their pleasure. It was about bringing eternal glory to God himself look what I can do we see miracle number seven the Israelites continue their journey and they soon find themselves facing their bitter enemy the Amalekites the Amalekites were considered Israel's perennial enemy they sometimes served as mercenaries fighting for Israel's enemies they just hated the Israelites Again, the Amalekites were in front of them, standing between them and where they needed to go. Moses commands, Moses commands Joshua to take the men to battle. And as Joshua obeyed, Moses takes his rod. He invites Aaron and her, and they go to the mountainside to pray. And as Moses is praying, he's lifting up his hands. And victory is won. When he grows weary, he drops his hands and the battle tide begins to turn. So Aaron and her, they lift up his weary hands. And as his hands are raised and in prayer, God brings victory to the Israel. Together with arms raised, victory is found over the Amalekites. Again, it's just a reminder that in our weariness of battle, we're reminded in the New Testament by the Apostle who says, do not grow weary in well-doing. It, it is not easy for us to fight sometimes through the weariness. And we cannot, we cannot depend solely upon our own strength and strategy, but we must depend mightily on His might and power. And that day, victory was attributed to God himself through the force of his strength. Finally, the Israelites made it to the Jordan River. Just over the river was the land of promise. They could see it. 
They were excited. Finally, it was here. Friends, let's be reminded that being close to home doesn't mean that we are home. As they were readying themselves to cross over, the discouraging word came that Moses had died. Joshua was their newly appointed leader. And as they looked to Joshua, they asked, what next? How will you see us across the body of water? Joshua, having watched Moses so many times, went to God in prayer. And God answered just as he had done so many times for Moses. As Joshua shared with the Israelites what God had revealed to him, they got in line and they followed his command. Joshua ordered the people to consecrate themselves, washing themselves their clothes the next day. He assembled them in a half mile behind the Ark of the Covenant. He told the Levite priests to carry the Ark to the Jordan River, which has this time been swollen and it was treacherous, overflowing its banks with the snow that had been melting from Mount Hermon. As soon the, the priest waded into the, uh, with the ark, the water stopped flowing and piled in a heap nearly 18 miles north of the village in the village of Adam. It was also cut off, cut off to the south. And while the priest waded with the ark in the middle of the river, the entire nation crossed on dry ground. They had made it. They were in their promised land. The battle for their land was just about to begin, but before they began the battle, they prepared under the instructions of God to Joshua. Each tribe was to have one of their men that had been appointed to bring with them a stone from the center of the river. And there they were to use those stones to build a memorial. Joshua chapter 4 in our text, verses 19 through 24, gives us the detail. The people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel passed over this Jordan right here on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. So, listen to this, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This is what it was all about. This was the reason in which God had planned the path the children of Israel were to take. It wasn't easy. It wasn't without frustration. But in the end, they watched God keep his promise as they crossed over into their promised land. And they could look back over their journey and share of the goodness and the greatness and the faithfulness and the power of their one true living. God. Our musicians are coming forward. I can only imagine as the years came and went, the many families brought their children and grandchildren to this magnificent memorial. And over and over again, when they were asked all about it, I can just hear them as they would launch into the great story of how their, their God-chosen path led them from slavery and bondage to safety to their homeland. Perhaps one of the children would have asked inquisitively, Father, Mother, this God who led you safely here, this God who's done such mighty and wonderful things, who is he? What does he look like? I can imagine a father choking back his tears, blessed from his head to his feet, as he would answer, Son, daughter, I have never seen the face of God 
But I want to tell you, I have seen what he can do. I have watched as he has sent an old shepherd to be our deliverer from bondage and slavery. I watched him lead us along the journey by sending us a cloud and day, a pillar of fire at night. I have stood amazed as when all we thought that death was an inevitable, the Red Sea divided and we walked across on dry land. There were over a million of us, but time and again, God supplied every one of our needs with food and meat and water and clothing. I joined in the battle as we watched the Amalekites go down and defeat the children and children. It was at this very place right here that the Jordan River was divided for nearly 20 miles and we walked across and we obtained our homeland. Oh, son, daughter, we have maybe have never seen his face, but I truly have seen the hand of God displayed over and over and over again. This morning, as a child of God, we have in our rearview mirror a host of miracles that God has performed in our lives, our own memorials, if you will. He has comforted us when we thought our world was ending because of grief. He has supplied our needs every time when we thought that the meal and our barrel had run out. He has led us through His Word and presence when the way was dark and confusing. He has opened the doors of despair when it gripped our hearts because we did not know what good could come from such situation. The devil has bombarded us over and over again, but yet God has given us the strength to rise up and with strength and power of heaven defeat the enemy of our souls. Oh, my friend, these might be some great stories that we can share with our children and grandchildren and in our community but I would dare say the greatest of all miracles was when Jesus Christ saved us from our sins when in our lostness in our darkness Jesus found us when we were trapped and tangled in sin addictions held us fast we had no way out he came to recover and to restore friend I have this morning no sad story to share has the way with Jesus always been comfortable and pleasurable? By all means, no. This past week, I have been reminded that on my journey, and I remind you on your journey, it isn't about our comfort and our pleasure, but it's about us submitting to the will of God. It's about God taking the will of our life, uh, setting our path, and whatever it is, Lord, would you take it and bring glory and honor to yourself and on this journey when people will ask us what does God look like is there a God and how do you know we can look them with confidence in the eye and say while I've never seen the face of God I surely have seen what he can do and friends that is enough for me that is enough for me to believe. That is enough for me to exercise faith. That is enough for me to say, I'll go with Him. I'll go with Him all the way. Listen as Pastor McCarty closes out our service this morning with a beautiful song. It simply says, while we've not seen the face of God, we have seen what He can do. After this song, you're dismissed. I'm
have seen what he can do. Well, I've thought about the wonders around us every day and the stuff that if you'd let it would take your breath away. And I've also found his glory shining from within in the heart of a sinner who's just been born again I've been to the river what souls going under forgiveness washed them clean and mercy made them new gone is the old tell you first hand I've never seen the face of God but I've seen what he can do oh for now I don't need a picture somehow this whole world helps me see him a little I've walked in the valleys, cried out from my sorrow, and I can tell you every fire that he has brought me through. And I know him better, and I love him forever. I've never seen the face of No, I've never seen the face of God, but I've seen what He can do.